bow our heads in an opening word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are here to give thanks. To, th to give thanks and praise to you, our living God, who promises to be with us in the presence of the Spirit of Jesus. We thank and praise you for the opportunity and the privilege of gathering here together as members of your one family of faith. We thank you, Lord, for the word that you sustain us with. We thank you for the saints of, of the past who have led us and helped to contribute to leading us through our spiritual pilgrimage here on earth who have shown us the way of faith and of spirituality. And we thank you at this, on this occasion especially for the LWML and all the women of our congregation who are part and portion of that missionary organization. We thank you for all their contributions and for what they do in terms of helping prop, uh, prompt and, and forward the, the mission that you have given us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. And Lord, as we are gathered here now, we pray for your hand of blessing upon this message, upon this word which is broken open before us today. We pray that through that word, your spirit might touch our souls, our hearts, our minds, our beings, so that we might recommit ourselves to uh, being your messengers out there in a world where it really comes. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name then. Amen. Well, today as a basis for the message, I've chosen the second reading that you heard read from 2 Timothy, and if you want to just turn to that and keep that before you uh, to refresh your mind as, as we move through it, uh, it'd be helpful. I'm going to reread the first two verses of that second reading. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. As we consider today's sermon theme, are you really ready to confess Jesus? Are you really ready to confess Jesus? Now before God and before Christ Jesus, who is to judge men living and dead, I abjure you by his coming appearance and his reign to proclaim the message, press it home on all occasions, convenient or inconvenient, use argument, reproof, and appeal with all the patience that the work of teaching requires. There is a reading of the text. By the way, I read it from the New English Bible. My well, brother and sister in Christ, the year 2017 has really been a rather exciting year for us as Lutheran Christians. First of all, of course, we have been celebrating the 500th anniversary of Luther's posting of his 95 Theses on the chapel door at Wittenberg. And because of this, because of this special celebration, the whole world seems to be paying more attention to Luther and his impact upon the direction of world history. But there is even more to the year 2017 for us as Lutheran Christians. Because this year marks the 75th anniversary of the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, our own LWML, which has done so much to encourage and support the sharing of Christ's gospel within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, as well as among its partners and friends throughout the world. And this indeed is a big deal.
in the half millennium since the Reformation began, and the 75 years since the LWML formally orga organized itself. Confessing the faith has not gotten any easier. In fact, it may be even more difficult for us to speak and live as Christians today, given the seismic cultural and religious fragmentation which is taking place all around us. And who knows what the future holds for us as Christians? Who knows what the future holds for our children and our grandchildren? And yet, God is faithful and has promised that his church will survive all the challenges that the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh throw against it. Building on God's promises then, we know that this is our time, our time here and now, to be distinctly Lutheran. As confessing Lutherans in a rapidly changing world and in an increasing hostile culture, we need to be ready to, to, to confess the gospel of Jesus and do it to a world that still desperately needs to hear that gospel's message. Well, the very first point I want to bring forward from this lesson today is this. Confessing Jesus is central to our identity as Christians. To be proclaimers of his message of salvation is the core of our identity as the children of God. Writes Paul in today's first part of that second reading, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and the coming of his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with the complete patience that the work of teaching the word it takes. Well, when St. Paul wrote these words to Timothy, as he did to one who was a fellow pastor, Timothy was a young man, perhaps in his young 20s, and perhaps even younger than that, perhaps he had a teenager. A young man specifically called to carry out the office of the public ministry in the community in which he was living. And Paul did so knowing full well the challenges that faced preachers of the gospel in the environment of the newly established church. But Paul also did so knowing that Timothy had come to the faith through the work of the Holy Spirit, working through the faithful teaching of a committed mother and a dedicated grandmother. I am reminded of your sincere faith, writes Paul to Timothy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first with your grandmother Lois, and then your mother Eunice, which now, I am sure, a faith that dwells within you. The good news of the gospel is given to each of us to share with those whom God places in our sphere of influence, regardless of our station in life. Proclaiming the gospel of Christ, a salvation won by Jesus, is not just the pastor's job. 
like Lois and Eunice before us. Every single one of us is called to be ready to confess Jesus as God opens a door of opportunity for us to do so. Indeed, we are called to be ready to confess. And the need for sharing Christ is as pronounced today as it ever was. While it is true that somewhere around 90% of Americans claim that they believe in God, their understanding of the one true God is often far less than biblical. And add to that fact that upwards of 60% of evangelical Christians, a category that would also include most Lutherans, think there might be other ways to salvation outside of faith in Jesus. Yes, the need to be ready to confess the message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, is as pressing today as ever. Add to this Paul's realistic assessment of where people were at during his time, during the time he wrote the words of our second reading. As he tells us in that second reading, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths of all kinds. My brother and sister in Christ, this sounds like 2017, does it not? But not just 2017, also in 1517, the setting in which God called Martin Luther to confess Christ was easily as confused and chaotic as in our day. In his day, worship of saints had intruded into the worship of Christ. Good works were preached as necessary to salvation in addition to believing in Jesus. Purgatory, images, relics, and other aberrations had obscured the gospel of salvation in Christ alone and had done so in an overwhelming manner. This context, of course, led to the unique character of the Lutheran Reformation. For Luther, as he read the New Testament, and as he poured over Paul's epistle to the Romans, he was confronted by the question of righteousness. What does it mean exactly to be right in the eyes of God? And the scriptures made it clear to him. If you're going to be right in the eyes of God, you must keep God's law perfectly. However, Luther knew that he did not keep God's law perfectly. He knew that he didn't even keep God's law sufficiently. Why, as a frail human being, he wasn't even close to that goal. Oh, he tried to get to the goal, all right. He went to his priest repeatedly and confessed his sins, for example. He dredged up his every thought and word and deed from a lifetime of sin, confessed it, was conditionally absolved of it, and then went and did good works as a satisfaction for that sin. But as he did all this, he remembered yet other sins. His mind recalled other things that he had done or failed to do, and he realized that his confession of sin, no matter how exhaustive, was not sufficient. And that meant his good works were not enough. Finally, in frustration, this confessor, 
the priest to whom he was laying out all of this stuff. He exploded, in a sense, out of frustration and said, Luther, it is not that God hates you. It is that you hate God. The dam finally broke for Luther. It broke when he understood through the scriptures that being right with God, that the righteousness of God is not about being good enough. The righteousness of God is singly and solely alone about Christ and about Christ alone. Jesus Christ, the God-man, who has procured salvation for Luther, for you, for me, and done so perfectly once and for all. And there is a great exchange that occurs here through Jesus. The filthy rags of our own self-righteousness, our sinfulness, and our insistent rebellion toward God, all of which Jesus took upon his own body, upon himself, he carried it all to a cross. And he was crucified once and for all, for it all. This man-oriented righteousness is replaced. It is replaced with the perfect righteousness that belongs to God himself. A righteousness conveyed to this world in and through the person of Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And this Jesus now clothes us with a different righteousness, this righteousness which we receive by faith. Where before we walked with a righteousness wholly unacceptable in the eyes of the living God. Where before we stood before God as nothing more than a rebel or sinner. God now sees us as perfectly redeemed as a child of his in and through Christ. Where we stood before God, separated and estranged from God, we now stand together with him as a dear and beloved friend of his, fully acceptable in his eyes. Yes, indeed, dear friend. One righteousness, no better than filthy rags in God's sight, has been replaced. It's been replaced with a righteousness as pure and as clean as the fresh fallen snow. And this, brother and sister in Christ, is the biblical gospel. It is what we must be ready to confess. Luther didn't see all that clearly in 1517. It took him a few years to work through all the scriptural implications of it. But once he did, he was ready to confess. And risking life and limb, he did so to the very end of his life which ended in 1546. Which poses a question for you and me. How do we, like Luther, prepare ourselves to be ready to confess? Today in particular, as we've already noted, we want to call attention to the work of the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, which is celebrating its diamond anniversary this year. The LWML has had a marvelous impact on the mission efforts on the congregations, the districts, and the seminaries and the ministries and efforts of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. It has done so always by carrying out faithfully its mission to, quote, assist each woman of the Lutheran Church in affirming her relationship with the triune God so that she is enabled to use her gifts in ministry 
to the people of this world. End of quote. You know, there is never a perfect time to start an organization like the LWML. But could we have chosen a time more challenging than the year 1942? The world had been at war for three years. And the United States had joined the effort of that war only late in 1941. Rations were short. Many young and older men were preparing to fight overseas. Women were entering the workforce and to fill the vacancies left by the men who had left to serve in the armed forces. Indeed, the circumstances of that day were challenging, to say the least. And yet, on July 7th and 8th of 1942, over 100 women, among them 28 formal delegates, met in Chicago and established the LWML. Its purpose was to encourage a greater consciousness amongst women of the Lutheran Church for missionary education, missionary inspiration, and missionary support and service. It also decided to gather funds for mission projects above and beyond the Synod's own budget. From this humble beginning and through the use of the now familiar mic boxes, the League has blessed the mission efforts of congregations, districts, and synod in amazingly powerful ways. But there is more. As LWML historian Marlis Moberg has captured it well when she writes, The blessing of the LWML, now also known as the women, Lutheran Women in Mission, goes far beyond the millions raised for missions. Its benefits can be seen in faith deepened through Bible studies, in confidence built through leadership training, in the befriending of career missionaries, in blankets and clothing gathered for the impoverished, in food shared with the hungry, and above all else, in the friendships nurtured and the lives changed by the sharing of the love of Jesus. Well, brother and sister in Christ, time marches on, as we all know so well. And it seems that as we age, it marches at an ever-quickening pace. The Lutheran Confession of Jesus has always struggled with the intrusion of false teachings. But the Lord has been faithful. He's raised up faithful pastors like Timothy, who have preached the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins and raised for our justification. And the Lord has gathered faithful men and women and children who have carried out the work of the Lord with zeal and devotion, meeting the challenges and opportunities to reach out to those who need to hear that gospel and hear it clearly. Simply put, our faithful God keeps his promises. And we pray on this Sunday and always that he will always enable us as his children of faith to be ready to confess Jesus and his saving gospel. In his name we pray that. At this time, let us rise and respond to the word of God.